In this video, we're going to do something that's rare, actually, which is look at a sensible critique of Jordan Peterson. The critique is made by Hans-Georg Muller from the channel Carefree Wandering. And we're going to present Hans-Georg Muller's picture of why Peterson is successful, his critique of Peterson, and then we're going to critique Hans-Georg Muller's critique. And the reason this matters isn't because it's perilous to our culture to get Jordan Peterson right and find out where he goes wrong and where he doesn't. It's really important because Peterson is such a big phenomenon that we've got to acknowledge that unless we get him right, we're not going to understand something about us ourselves. Forget about Peterson. We're not going to understand something about us ourselves that's quite important and that we do need to understand. And this leads us to a very basic problem, which is that nearly anybody who has made a critique of Jordan Peterson so far hasn't been as intelligent as Jordan Peterson. And the people who are more intelligent than Jordan Peterson just haven't said anything critical about him. They just haven't gone there. And so there has been this sort of bizarre vacuum. And actually, it's part of our self-understanding, part of our collective self-understanding, that we've got to correct that vacuum. And to that extent, I'm critical of my colleagues in the Academy. Uh, for just not saying anything about Peterson except sort of little remarks, uh, you know, privately made um, in the academic corridor. So let's go. I'll just reconstruct Hans-Georg Muller's account off the top of my head, if I can. I think Hans-Georg Muller feels that Peterson is um, very smart, is very uh, media savvy. He's engaged in self-help, which really sells in our culture. And then Hans-Georg Muller feels that Peterson acts as a kind of defender, somebody who speaks vicariously for people who feel and think certain things, but don't feel free to utter them in public because they're sort of covered up by kind of a cling film of wokeism and political correctness. And then over and above that, this mode of defending that Peterson engages in has a kind of um, moralite. Oh, this is really important. The Peterson video has to be done with Peterson hand movements. And so the moralizing that Peterson does is um, sort of a kind of angry moralizing. So, so Peterson defends uh, the people he defends via a mode of angry moralization, which Hans Georg Muller rather contrasts with um, the sort of thing that Zizek is up to, and Zizek does irony, paradox, humor. And that sells well too, but perhaps Peterson's sort of angry moralization sells even better. And to uh, begin elaborating his brief critique of Jordan Peterson, Hans-Georg Muller turns to Freud's three insults to human vanity. First insult is the idea that we can no longer in the modern world um, stick with the idea of there being a cosmic point of view, a cosmic scheme of things. The idea that human beings have some kind of measure, measured, uh, some sort of, sort of measure of cosmic significance. Um, the second Freudian insult to human vanity is the idea that we've got evolutionary theory. So we've now got a particular kind of picture of ourselves in the animal kingdom that's realistic and might run contrary to certain um, collective fancies, collective self-fancies of humanity. And the third insult is psychoanalysis itself. The idea that psychoanalytic understanding shows us that all the conscious stuff that we thought was central is froth atop a glass to be just blown off once we come to understand the mind properly. And Hans-Georg Muller adds a fourth insult. And he says that's a sociological insult. And the sociological insult is basically that um, we have got to realize that we used to overestimate the power of the sovereign and rational individual. And that if we understand society properly, what we will see is that there are many spheres within it which operate in accordance with systems that make individual agency possible, but then that that individual agency isn't enough to steer, uh, control, 
create, recreate these systems. Um, it operates within them, but doesn't have some kind of, um, you know, executive control over them that we're used to attribute to it. And so we need to really climb quite far down the hill, if you like, of our metaphysical ambition of what the agency of the sovereign rational individual amounts to. And actually, Hans-Georg Muller says it's on this fourth error that we can really hit Peter Peterson because this is what he's committed to. He's committed to um, an inflated account of the rational individual sovereign agent. And uh, here he just partakes in, in illusion. Moreover, it seems to be clear to me that Jordan Peterson's individualism, somewhat paradoxically, is produced under the very postmodernist conditions described by theoreticians such as McLuhan, Baudrillard, De Boer, and others. He's defending individualism at a time when the media production of identity, and specifically the media production of his own identity, contradicts this very message. He uses the traditional semantics of individuality and authenticity, but the social conditions within which he does this contradict this very semantics. So, the problem I have with Hans-Georg Muller's critique is that actually the real trouble for Jordan Peterson, and we're going to put this front and center in other videos because it actually hasn't been said before at all. But the real problem with Jordan Peterson is something to do with his historical understanding of the modern world and the fact that Peterson can't commit himself on the question of whether the existential, political, social, psychological crises we face in the modern world are in a very deep and inherent way products of the special conditions of the modern world, or are they just problems that human beings face in different cultural circumstances? And you see, the problem for Peterson is that because he doesn't distinguish between these two possibilities, he then can't distinguish within the um, arguments he advances about what's wrong with our society. He can't distinguish between complaint um, you know, the culture of complaint and the mode of explanation. In other words, Peterson might say all kinds of critical things about where we are at. Um, this is a beautiful natural rosé. Um, um, Peterson might say all kinds of things about where we are at, uh, but he has no way to actually blast them out of just mere complaint about the world into the true mode that we are after, which is the mode of fundamental critique and explanation. In other words, he can't really place these problems he's speaking out in a proper explanatory context that tells us where they have come from, why they're here, why we are here with them, and to what extent can we or should we go forward in them, come back out of them. And so, the reason, therefore, that we want to be a bit critical of Hans-Georg Moller is that Peterson's trouble really does come from Freud's three insults to human vanity. That Peterson isn't clear about how to understand them and how far they make, or their truth, makes the conditions of the modern world special. So let's just sort of briefly look at you know, uh, the first one of the three. The cosmic thing. I mean, the, the cosmic thing is interesting because um, we need to get this right. When we say that we've lost the, the cosmic scheme of things, we've lost faith that that's something we can truthfully believe in, we're not saying that human beings used to have a high cosmic significance and now they have a low one. We're saying that the very scale, that very ruler that measures cosmic significance is just unavailable. There is no such thing as co cosmic significance. There are no purposes in the world outside of human purposes. And Peterson's confused on this, um, and even proud to be confused. He says, look, um, I don't know to what extent we've lost the sense of cosmic purposes. We may have lost it, we may have not lost it. Can we have it both ways? And then over and above that, Peterson sticks a pragmatist epistemic position, which is actually quite a bit 
further out from the typical kind of objectivism that folks committed to the cosmic scheme of things go with. And instead, of course, that's a picture that uh, makes Peterson epistemically come very close to the postmodernism that he is critiquing. And then the same goes for um, the consequences of understanding that we're kind of ill-assorted, an ill-assorted combination of various kinds of um, capabilities that have evolved over a very long period of time, um, and that you know our mind's picture is a certain kind of picture that disenchants us out of certain prejudices about how the human mind works. What does all of this amount to, Jordan? Does this make our circumstances really special, or does it not? You see, we'll talk about this in much more detail, but that's the question Peterson fails to answer. And then on the fourth insult to um, human vanity that hans Georg Müller adds on, on Freud's behalf, as it were, here Peterson is actually halfway. He can admit a lot of what hans Georg Müller is saying. I mean, just look at Peterson's pathological position on the climate crisis, which he rather plays down. Um, um, and, you know, it does so by a big fancy of uh, Bjorn Lomborg. Um, but Peterson actually does go on to say, look, um, the problem with the climate crisis is that you might tidy your room and sort that out, but when you begin acting out there in the political world, things are complex. Intentions uh, will not often result in what you are intending to produce in the real world. Um, there are many complex spheres in the world of political action, that they're very complexly related. Um, there are so many unpredictable consequences and so on. And so actually, Peterson is not going to be a billion miles away from admitting, or at least half admitting, the fourth insult to human vanity. But one final remark, actually, is going to be a score for Peterson and, and not a score for Hans-Georg Moller, and it's this. Um, Peterson is closer to Nietzsche than Hans-Georg Moller, and actually, um, engaging in a certain kind of tension that Hans-Georg Müller wants to step out of, because Hans-Georg Müller implies, at least in the video, that these insults to human vanity uh, just bring with us observations about various illusions we've got to let go of. And Hans-Georg Müller, as a deep reader of Nietzsche, knows that's not Nietzsche's view, because Nietzsche felt, look, it might be that we truthfully do have to let go of these illusions, but it might also be the case that we can't live without them. And Peterson actually does, unlike Hans-Georg Müller, in, engage, even indulges in this tension. And that's really worth bringing out. Um, and how would you apply that to politics? Well, Nietzsche doesn't because Nietzsche's a superficial political thinker, but if he were to, it'd be something like this. Look, and actually, Peterson doesn't apply to politics either, because Peterson isn't that political in the way he thinks about the world. But the political application would be, look, the stories we've told ourselves to explain to ourselves, to justify to ourselves our institutions no longer add up. And yet we want our institutions, we want our democracies not to die. So what are we going to do? We can either sort of um, uh, go on with these old stories, which we can only half believe in, or we've got to invent new stories that justify our institutions as they are, even better than they are. Is anything like that available? Can we do that? This is a good point at which to end, I think. Um, take really, really good care. I'm going to try this wine finally. Boil watermelon candy, cucumber brine. Um, there's a lot going on there. Um, tell me how you are in the comments and uh, look forward to uh, speaking soon. <laughs>